I love what I'm seeing already. <laughs> Morning David, thank you so much for inviting me over to your paddock. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm seeing bees and flowers and butterflies. It's really gorgeous. So You're looking welcome. forward to having a look. Good. So tell me a bit about the meadow. You've, you've owned it for about 16 years. Yes, we, um, when we came here, uh, it, it was a very different place. We, we've lived here for about 16 years. Uh, we decided that I think we'd always wanted um, to explore having a meadow for the first couple of years. I think we decided that we would just leave well alone and see what happened. We had it grazed at the end of the summer um, and we did very little else. And for the first two or three years, um, nothing much happened. And then we started to see signs of um, particularly trefoil, bird's foot trefoil, starting to um, take hold. Uh, and then we learnt about um, the lovely yellow rattle. Um, and I think after about five years, uh, possibly even a bit later, when we realised that some of the vigorous um, grasses, particularly the rye grasses, were just not playing ball. Uh, we decided that um, we would very tentatively start to introduce some yellow rattle. So we, I uh, probably shouldn't say this, but we stole some seed from a farm up on the moor, not very far away. <laughs> we just leant over the hedge and grabbed a few handfuls. <laughs> and um, not that you would notice, smoothed the grass over after we'd finished and um, uh, we literally went around we have quite a lot of moles uh, so we went around sprinkling it on the mole hills and just treading the mole hills down and then I have a feeling that whatever was grazing probably did the rest yeah uh, I think in terms of the 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 vigorous grasses, um, it really has made an impact uh, in terms of laying the ground, just creating a kind of canvas for other things to be able to take hold. And over the last, particularly over the last five or six years, I think we've seen things really take off in terms of the number of species that have arrived. And to be honest, we've we've introduced only yellow rattle. I think we're we're desperate to try and get some wild carrot growing, but all the neighbours say that wild carrot doesn't really do it in this part of the world. It usually is on limestone or limey, okay. so, so we it may, might not like it. Yeah, it might yeah. not like it, but yeah. we're going to have a go. Interestingly, we've got one wild carrot which is growing in the woodland. Oh right. <laughs> so um, hey ho. But um, a lot of what you see here um, has simply arrived on its own or um, was perhaps in the seedbed anyway and has just yeah. um, suddenly had a chance to thrive. Yeah, especially if, it's, if, if the grasses are knocked back, the wildflowers have more of a chance. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Steve and I are beginning to wonder whether, you know, we have too much yellow rattle now. Uh, so. Part of our management is to, uh, we've invested in a couple of scythes and we may do selective um, scything of certain areas um, if we find that certain species um, take a hold too much. We're never quite sure what that is. I, I think our, our general rule is just leave it alone and see what happens. Yeah. And, um, and wonderful, wonderful things do happen. Uh, we, we've, we've got a bit of a hogweed problem um, because we always had this dilemma, you know, if you walked around and saw the number of insects there were on a hogweed flower, yeah. we would be saying, oh, we can't cut that yet. Um, and we still do that, but I, I think what we've done is to leave areas of hogweed um, there's a big area up behind me here 
uh, which um, is, is food for an awful lot of insects and where there is hogweed growing in amongst other species and likely to take control then we, we do get in there with, gently with the scythe and just nip it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's quite a steep um, plot, uh, it's really not good for the ankles or the kneecaps after you spent a day in here. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's probably very little chance of ever getting it mowed. Yeah. Um, we've never had it mowed, we've had various combinations of grazing animals. Um, anything from Shetland ponies, three or four Shetland ponies who've arrived uh, courtesy of a local farmer. Um, I think they, they come, they have come between anything between September and December I think or even ja as late as January. Yeah. If it's after January, then it's a no-go because um, we have a lot of primroses and a lot of violets, so um, we don't really want those grazed off after that time. Uh, we've also had, uh, well last year we had a, a small gang of Jersey heifers who were very enthusiastic. Um, unfortunately, they arrived in what was a very wet autumn here. And uh, so they've created quite a lot of puddling in the paddock, quite a lot of indents in the paddock. So it's quite, it needs to settle a bit. And we had a very boisterous pony for a, a few weeks after the, the cattle came. Mm. We've had Shetland ponies followed by sheep or the other way around, I can't quite remember. Um, to be honest, I've not really noticed any substantial difference in in terms of what grows mm. and where it grows yeah. um, in relation to how or when it's grazed but the general rule for us is that if you can bring your your animals in at the end of September and they're gone by Christmas yeah. um, then great and and it's very um, you know, it's not huge herds of things. It's mm. it's it's quite gentle grazing. It's an, an what's the maximum number of cows you've had in here? Uh, four, five. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I can almost remember all their names. <laughs> One was called Hillary, <laughs> and uh, the maximum number of sheep probably about ten. Yeah. So it's only two point seven acres. So the cows were here for maybe two weeks. At right. the most, okay. and then Just it recovered, and then we had one pony after that. Yeah, okay, great. Shetland ponies, we've had as many as five, I think, um, trotting around, and they stay very easily over winter. Um, yeah, we've even seen them with snow on their backs. Oh, oh. <laughs> they're cute, aren't they? They are very yeah. cute, they are yeah. very cute. Great. Well, let's go and have a, a look round, shall we? Sure. Yeah. Come to you then. So this meadow's on Dartmoor. Um, do you know what the underlying geology is? Is it acidic or...? Uh, I think it's, it is acidic. Um, I think it's pretty patchy. Um, certainly where we garden further down below the meadow. Um, there seem to be all different kinds of soil, lots of stone, um, but I think overall acid lovers tend to do well. Yeah. They tend to do well. I've noticed some some of the species like the Angelica are, you know, like the wetter conditions. Is it wet at other times of the year? It's not wet at the moment, but... It's really dry at the moment. Uh, I think we had a really wet autumn last year. Um, we're supposedly on the dry side of the moor uh, not that i've noticed to be honest <laughs> Sue, but um and and we what seems to be happening in terms of climate and i think it has slightly changed since we've been here whether it's changing permanently or whether it's just a, a phase that we're going through but we tend to get prolonged periods of wet and then prolonged periods of dry right so you would, I would have thought that with all that Dartmoor rain that we got in the autumn that we would never seem to need to water anything. 
but actually things are quite then dry it, dra at the it must drain quite quickly because yeah. of the slope it drains really yeah. quickly it's a very steep slope so yeah. i think that one of the things that we might have noticed as well which i always find interesting is that the, because it's so steep the ye yellow rattle tends to move down the bank uh, so the path that we mowed uh, in the first couple of years was much higher up and that's where we sowed all the yellow rattle so mm. that we would literally go along all the molehills along that path and we would sort of kick them over sow the yellow rattle and then tread them in uh, that's where all the yellow rattle started and it's gradually moved further and further down the bank so in fact we it's even gone over it's the nearly hawthorn reached hedge the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it, yeah it's gone over the hawthorn hedge and it's actually now on the on the terraces in the orchard oh. um, and whilst we might have actually sown some in the orchard i think things are gradually moving down the hill certainly the the hogweed that we were the hogweed jungle that we were just talking about yeah. moves down the hill so we yeah. find we have to control it in this part of the paddock um, and and leave it do its thing up there which will probably be something that we'll do forever because it will just keep moving yeah, down. Yeah. But, so uh, the prevailing wind would be coming across the meadow if that's southwest down there. Yeah it comes and then from... And you've got your south face, facing slope so you've got gravity, you've got the wind. That's right. So yeah and we tend to, that's interesting actually I've never thought about that before because we anything, do can, tend to get drifts of things yeah, going that way anything with light seeds will go that the, way the and meadow. anything with heavier seeds will go that way yeah so further up behind the chestnut tree uh, we have bands of pig nut that gener generally run along mm. the contours of the meadow uh, followed by um, you know cat's ears and parsley now uh, that's something that guess... seems to be happening and the knapweed seems to do the same thing yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah interesting and the, obviously if you've got animals in here they're going to be taking the seed all over the field really something like um, the yellow rattle yeah um, you know because they're reasonably heavy seeds they're not sort of flyaway seeds particularly uh, it's interesting the yellow rattle thing because this is where Steve and I have a constant um, uh, tussle because I, I kind of like think that we might have too much yellow rattle mm. and, and occasionally I will, when we first introduced yellow rattle we were forever bashing it around and our, our Jack Russell Monty does quite a good yellow rattle movement <laughs> and, and Steve, you know, we would be on one of our walks around the meadow and, and we would find ourselves doing this wherever we saw some yellow rattle and now we've got yellow rattle everywhere <laughs> but then the, that's maybe when the cattle and the sheep do their mm. do their job because they yeah. will start to spread it particularly yeah. if it's wet and yeah. push it into the ground yeah. but next year i think that if it if it continues in the way that it's going i think we may explore cutting certain areas um, earlier in the year yeah so end of may or something or maybe harvesting harvesting the yellow rattle so yeah. that other people can have the joy of it absolutely <laughs> i've done some harvesting this year i, I filled up a, a two kilogram flower bag for a neighbor wow. who's starting her meadow off i think i i filled that bag up within about half an hour wow it's pretty easy we may become a donor in time. Yes, why not? The way things are going. <laughs> <laughs> you have certainly got quite a bit considering it was introduced. So, yeah, it's, it's not the grass is back and that's the idea for encouraging more wild flowers. So. It, it definitely has because when we came here, I think the paddock was largely, as I think I've said before, it, it was largely very tough grasses and it's i think it's absolutely amazing that you know this plant can suddenly reduce the vigor of one species so that other things can take hold mm. and and now we need to 
as part of the management, I think, there are certain things that we would like to introduce um, where the yellow rattle will have helped us do that. Mm. So, um, what's that little white, uh, not less stitch but the other thing, the I senior moment that. there? <laughs> the, uh, the eyebright, which I love, which is also parasitic, um, it, it, it would be good to have more eyebright, I think, just as a, a you know, an, an aesthetic thing, really. You know, it gives it a slightly different tapestry yeah. in terms of the way the meadow looks. It does normally need very short grass or, you know, yeah. maybe even rabbit grazed or something like that, yeah. usually. Yeah. yeah, so so that patch of eyebright that we saw seemed to miraculously arrive on its own. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure how that's happened. There must be some somewhere around here that's <laughs> sent its seed over. Sent its seed yeah. over, yeah. yeah. So I noticed you've got some bracken here. Yes. Um, you obviously don't mind it, so tell me a bit about no, your bracken. It was here when we arrived, um, and just a very small patch. Yeah. I think it's actually got bigger. Um, but this bank here in particular, and all the way down to the river, is uh, full in the spring of primroses and violets. So with a little bit of research, we realized that, you know, there is a very distinct relationship between uh, fritillaries and yeah. we get a number of silver wash fritillaries and bracken and violets. Yeah. So what we tend to do is to leave the, um, I mean, there is a path that we mow right the way through the middle of the bracken, but even that does a job because it encourages the violets to grow um, on the edge of the bracken which yeah. is what they like. I think eventually in the autumn the bracken falls over of its own accord, yeah. just runs out of steam and we cut it and leave it there and then clear it around springtime so that the violets um, can actually uh, really do their bit. Yeah. And I think it's the warmth of the bracken that keeps the little baby fritillaries <laughs> nice and warm in the winter. Yeah, uh, they overwinter as pupae. And, so, yeah. and then they do their bit. If okay. you leave bracken on the ground, the temperature is considerably warmer than yeah. actually if you remove the bracken. Yeah, you don't get frost under the bracken. Apparently not. So if, if you know, and because it's south facing, it'll be warmer even in the winter. It'll be warmer. Um, and if it's then insulated with the bracken. Yeah. 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 So it is invasive, uh, but actually the patch behind you, uh, it, it, it runs a bit under these trees. But with our handy scythe, uh, you can keep it at bay very easily. I mean, yeah. it's one of the things that I've, I, I've found is a, a joy having our newly purchased scythes is that scythes and bracken it's like going through butter so it's very easy to manage with the scythe yeah. and we used to use the dreaded strimmer um, and I think that's not going to do anything for the, the, the thatch if you can call it no, that's exactly. actually under the bracken so the scythe yeah. is much gentler um, it's much quieter yeah. uh, it's quite a meditative process and, and I can control it. I, I'm a hopeless strimmer. But, uh, you know, I, if I get a strimmer in my hand, then everything goes. Um, I don't like them at all. But with a scythe, I find I can control the bracken almost frond by frond, yeah. which, is, which is great. That's how yeah. I, I like to do it. I think we see Sounds really good. healthy populations of, of um, marble whites, silver wash fritillaries, commas, um, red admirals, peacocks. Uh, blues, uh, ringlets, meadow browns, uh, you know, at certain times of the year, as we've just seen when the sun came out, yeah. the meadow comes alive. Yeah. If any end of July, you would look down on the meadow and actually it would almost be vibrating because there was so much insect life and, yeah. and butterflies sort of jumping up and down. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Amazing. And that's that's something I hadn't really I hadn't really realised would happen yeah. just by changing the habitat. Um, 
So uh, that's absolutely thrilling. Yeah. And th this patch of bracken remains an experiment. And we don't actually see it happening, but we do see quite healthy populations of, of silverwash for yeah. tourists, so that's good. So the violets um, are the food plant for the fritillary butterflies. Yep. Um, so it's good to encourage those, and obviously they, they need a bit, a bit more of an open habitat. So while, whilst the bracken's still dormant, it's got a chance to, to come out and do its thing. That's right. And, and then when the bracken shades it out, it's already done what it needs to do anyway. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, you know, but largely this patch never changes, but uh, as you can see, there's a irritating bit down here <laughs> that um, has just passed its its uh, boundary, and uh, so that will go. Uh, but largely, we we kind of leave we leave that patch of bracken to do its thing. But I know for some people, it's the enemy. Well, it does tend to creep. So I guess what you're doing is is just saying, right, we'll have this much bracken and we'll keep it trimmed around the edge and, and yeah. that'll keep it in check. Yeah, and it yeah. is yeah. an enormous privilege, I think, uh, to, to have 2.7 acres that, that we can experiment with. Um, and the more we learn and the more we uh, experiment, the, the more results we actually see in terms of encouraging wildlife. So the next project is to loosen this boundary, free it up, I think, from its um, stock fencing and allow the hedgerow to become uh, less formal and less controlled, to spill out more into the meadow. Uh, and we'll see what that does, not only in terms of maybe bird populations. We were, we were talking about the fact that we get common lizards um, that bask sometimes along that bank in early spring, we see them when the stone is revealed. Yeah. Um, the brambles just want to grow out into the paddock anyway, so we decided that we might just let some brambles grow out into the paddock. Yeah, and, yeah they uh, are good for insects. And they'll be great for butterflies. Berries and everything. Yeah, yeah. So. Great, well it's good to see a bit of bracken being tolerated, because uh, it is needed for some species. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you've got a sensible amount in the proportion for the rest of the meadow. You know, it's not taking over really. So, yeah. No, it's it's hiding. You haven't got much rag work, but this one seems to have some cinnabar moth caterpillars on it. It does. We noticed them about a week or so ago. Interestingly, a number of ragwort plants further up the paddock and behind us. None of the others have caterpillars on them at the moment. We do tend to kind of like try and catch the ragwort just before it sets seed and keep it under control a bit. But uh, I'm interested to see what happens day by day with these caterpillars and where they go and what they do. We've got knapweed, we've got meadow buttercup, we've got ribwort plantain, bird's foot trefoil, yellow oh, rattle. rattle. So let's pick this and do a rattle. Oh yeah. It's making a rattly sound. You can see the yeah, seeds I inside it. I saw the seeds dropping actually as you were doing that. <laughs> Is that a bad thing? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Next year. I shall blame you when it's everywhere. So, so here's some meadow buttercup and here we've got some eye bright, which is a really cute little... So this is your scythe, wow that's impressive. Yeah, so this one is uh, an Austrian scythe and uh, the different, uh, this is a very recent acquisition um, we bought it on our scything course two or three weeks ago and um, I hadn't quite taken into account what murderous weapons they are because this is absolutely, well the whole idea is to keep really sharp. absolutely razor sharp. That's how I feel. Oh yeah, You're doing. really sharp. <laughs> <laughs> how did you know I was going to keep it still? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so this is a this is a meadow blade, um, and 
also uh, looks very new. Uh, I think they're very beautiful objects, really. I can't believe that people are still making them. I think that's lovely. Yeah, it's amazing. And then this one uh, it belongs to a friend who so is on long-term loan. But well, it's this, much shorter. This one has a ditch blade on it. Um, and this is the Bracken Killer. Ah. So uh, this one is very... Um, the smaller blade enables you to just somehow get under well I find it good for just getting under I <laughs> notice you're moving back I'm trying to get all of you in Move back to, so this is very good for just kind of like getting underneath uh, uh, an area of bracken and all you do is just you just nip it and gone but Sounds great. actually you know what we learned which is interesting is when you're scything Area, an area of meadow, there is a really lovely, um, quiet, meditative quality about what you're doing. Very different experience to trimming. Trimming, yes, trimming's a bit frantic and Very noisy. And, yeah. all, and also, somehow, uh, one can control it um, much better as well. Yeah. So, uh,